Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A newlywed with marriage problems supposedly falls to her death, but her injuries suggest that she was beaten. Who was responsible for the Wickenburg Massacre? Was it a tribe of Native Americans or an army deserter and his girlfriend? This ordinary looking chunk of stone may help answer the question, are there other life forms in the universe? And a woman loses her memory after surgery and then wanders away for more than three decades. Whether it's murder, larceny, or foul play, sometimes these cases are solved, thanks to you. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Just a few days before Christmas, the broken body of Michelle Witherall lies on the ground outside her apartment building. Michelle was only 24 years old and a newlywed. She and her husband, Jeremy, had just relocated from Denver and planned to build a new life together. And now, Michelle was in critical condition with severe head injuries. Tell me what happened up there? I don't know what happened. I mean, I, I... Jeremy told the police that Michelle fell from their apartment balcony three flights up. He said that he was playing solitaire in the living room when he heard a sound. He went outside, looked over the railing, and saw his wife's body on the ground below. And then I ran out to the balcony, I looked over, and there was Michelle lying there. And then I grabbed my phone and I dialed 911. That's the whole story. Paramedics rushed Michelle to a nearby hospital. Her parents claimed that Jeremy's mother called and told them the awful news. She also had a second version of Jeremy's story. She told me that there had been a terrible accident and that Michelle had been out on the balcony at their apartment and that she'd been putting up Christmas lights and that the balcony had collapsed, causing her to fall. We're looking for Michelle Witherall. When Michelle's family arrived at the hospital, they found Michelle in a coma. Hey, baby. The left side of her head was fractured and her jaw was broken. But Michelle's nose and teeth were unharmed, despite her 30-foot fall. Questions were beginning to come into our thoughts. How did she get her eye busted open and her jaw broken with no damage in between? He's squeezing my hand. Hang in there, sweetheart. We really think that her squeezing Ev's hand, she was telling us goodbye. Only two people in the world knew how Michelle had been injured, and now one of them was dead. Michelle's parents claimed that a few minutes after her death, Jeremy came up with a third story about how she fell. We just got home for dinner, and I was playing a game of solitaire. And Michelle and I, we weren't even talking. And then she went out to the balcony for something. And when I looked up, there she was, she was hanging. She was just barely hanging there. I could have got her. Jeremy claims he gave just one version of what happened to Michelle. That he only discovered that she had fallen when he saw her body on the ground below. But Michelle's parents still insist they were given three different stories. According to detectives, the couple was having trouble in their marriage, 
They say Jeremy admitted arguing with Michelle that night while driving back from a restaurant. He said the argument continued at home. Apparently, the newlyweds had been fighting so often that one neighbor complained repeatedly to the building manager. Violence is what she called it, physically throwing each other around the apartment. In no uncertain terms, she said, someone's going to get killed up there. And she was very frightened. She was scared. Michelle's parents began questioning the police investigation. Michelle's family found alarming contradictions between Jeremy's account and the physical evidence. To begin with, Michelle's wrists were broken, but her palms were completely unscratched. If she had fractured her wrist trying to break the fall, why didn't her palm show any cuts or scratches from the impact? Second, Michelle's shoes should have been on her or nearby. But one was discovered more than 20 feet from her body, and the other was never found. And third, Jeremy took the time to double lock the apartment before racing to his wife's side. The county coroner officially labeled the cause of Michelle's death as undetermined. That left three possibilities. Homicide, accident, or suicide. Michelle's parents insist it could not have been suicide. The Malemas also believe the accident theory is unlikely. The balcony railing was level with Michelle's chest, making it impossible for her to simply fall over it. Michelle's parents sent her medical records to three board-certified forensic pathologists. Their unanimous verdict? Michelle was murdered. And they said it wasn't the fall that killed her. The forensic experts said if Michelle had fallen three stories, she should have had injuries on both sides of her brain. The head injuries were quite extensive, but these were all left-sided. These injuries are what we call coup, direct impact injuries, as from a blow. Dr. Weck says other injuries also indicate that she was assaulted. Plus, he says parts of her body that were not harmed are just as important. For example, her pelvis wasn't broken, and her internal organs were all undamaged. That is extremely inconsistent, very atypical of the kinds of injuries that we would find in a fall. Finally, the county coroner's office opened the first official inquiry into the case. The verdict was quick and clear. We will amend the original from undetermined to homicide. The homicide ruling provided no scenario and no suspect, but Michelle's parents have a theory. They believe that she was murdered after telling Jeremy the marriage was over. Don't you raise your voice Don't to me! Don't talk to me like that! If you keep that I'm up, I'm leaving you! I think that night she made the mistake of telling Jeremy she was going to leave him. We think she ran from the apartment, fleeing for her life. She was then assaulted outside of the apartment. Michelle's parents believe that the balcony story was a quickly improvised cover-up. While no one on Jeremy's side was willing to be interviewed, they emphasized that Jeremy did pass a polygraph test twice. We told Jeremy from the day Michelle died that we want to find out and we plan to find out everything there is to find out. And we will pursue justice in this case no matter where it takes us. Update. Seven years to the day after Michelle's body was found outside her apartment, police charged Jeremy Weatherall with third degree murder and involuntary manslaughter. After two weeks of testimony and two hours of deliberation, he was acquitted. Jurors said conflicting testimony about the cause of the injuries influenced their verdict. The police have closed the case and ruled it a suicide, accidental death. Coming up, the legendary Wickenburg Massacre. 
was the attack carried out by Apaches or a ruthless con man? On a quiet highway 60 miles from Phoenix, a small monument stands at the edge of the road. Apaches! It honors the victims of a once infamous shootout in the days of the Wild West. By the end of the attack, six men were dead. One had been stabbed with a lance, another was scalped. This atrocity would become known as the Wickenburg Massacre. Somehow, two people managed to survive. Though they were injured, William Kruger and Molly Shepard lived on to provide the official account of what happened that day. The story told by Kruger and Shepard led the United States government to retaliate. The result was the deaths of hundreds of Native Americans. And now, more than a century later, some historians believe that Kruger and Shepard might have planned the attack themselves, hoping to steal a small fortune from the stagecoach. November 5th, 1871, William Kruger and Molly Shepard climb aboard a stagecoach in Wickenburg. Shepard was a well-known prostitute and madam who had recently sold her brothel. Kruger was a two-time army deserter who had somehow convinced the military to hire him as a civilian clerk. So this is how it happened. We got the day after the attack, while Shepard was recuperating, Kruger was questioned by Captain Charles Meinhold, who was assigned to investigate the incident. Sir, I believe it was about 11 a.m. or so that I heard the driver yell, Apaches, Apaches. And the next thing I know, sir, these Indians are firing on us. And, and they got Mr. Loring, you know, the, the famous author. And then they wounded uh, Mr. Salmon. He smelled just like the fish, you know. And he got out the back of the coach, and he went running the other way. And these Indians, they, they swooped down on him, sir. They, I saw him, and I fired back, sir. They, they scalped him, you know, in the, in the coach. And, and, uh, and, and Mr. Hamill and I, you know, we were fighting. And he was hit so bad that he couldn't go anywhere. And I knew our only chance, sir, our only chance was to just make a run for it. And during that split second, Molly and I, we got out the other side, and we just took off running in the opposite direction, sir, until we finally got away. Thank you, Mr. Kruger, for your cooperation. Thank you, sir. God bless. Lieutenant, tell the men we'll ride at sunup. I want to get a look at this site myself. By the time Meinhold reached the site, the victims' bodies had been returned to Wickenburg for burial. He uncovered several clues suggesting that Native Americans had been involved. Well, Meinhold was a, a military person and looked at it, uh, I guess, like a military would. And he really carefully, he studied the footprints, the, the moccasin prints, which they were wearing moccasins. And that most of the moccasin, uh, most of them were towed in, which is typical of the way as Native Americans walk. The tracks led towards a reservation 25 miles away. It was home to 750 members of the Yavapai tribe. But strangely, several miles before the tracks reached the reservation, they veered off in a different direction. This, to me, would indicate possibly a non-Native American group that is heading towards Camp Date Creek to make it look like the perpetrators are heading back to the reservation. The Yavapai, who were often misidentified as Apaches, were a largely peaceful people. Many worked as laborers and scouts for the settlers. To those who knew the tribe, it seemed inconceivable that they would have been involved in the attack. There were only six occasions uh, throughout the entire western frontier when American Indians actually, uh, Native Americans, attacked stagecoach. If this was a Native American attack, we would have found that the ammunition and the weapons certainly would have been missing. And uh, we would also found that any the blankets would have been taken. But in this particular case, none of it was touched whatsoever. But the most puzzling evidence was found in the bags of mail that had been loaded onto the stagecoach at Wickenburg. 
after the attack, a number of letters addressed to the Army Quartermaster had been opened and their contents carefully put back. Going through the mail, this is something that an Indian, Indian or Native American would not do, is go through the mail. Um, this certainly, you know, to me, would indicate that it was a non-Indian non attack. But if the Avapai were innocent, who were the killers and what was their motive? At the time, gold bullion was often transported by stagecoach. At least one account claims that Mexican bandits disguised as Apaches were responsible. Others suggest a more devious plan. Kruger and Shepard masterminded the entire thing. It had to be them. If it was bandits, Mexican bandits, or typical highwaymen, uh, why did they let Kruger and Shepard get away? So these Indians, they're slithering up on us like, like fibers coming back. Kruger's account of his escape seemed hard to believe. Researcher Jeff Hammond believes that Kruger and Shepard hired bandits to help them with the robbery. Kruger probably fired first to begin with inside the coach, the attacker shooting on the outside. Would have been easy to wipe out anybody inside the stagecoach. They wouldn't have expected somebody inside the coach to start shooting them. In his report, Captain Meinhold acknowledged rumors that the scheme was intended to rob the mail of the bullion usually shipped around the first of every month. And yet, Meinhold never said that the gold had actually been carried on that specific stagecoach run. Still, the stories persisted. There had to be something worthwhile. Uh, whatever it was, it was something that was privately owned. That was the reason it wasn't officially reported. The person that owned the money that was taken was dead. There was nobody left to be upset about it. Jeff Hammond believes that Kruger hid the loot somewhere near the massacre site where only he and Shepard could find it. Kruger had expected to walk out there a few days later and dig it up. Uh, he couldn't. He had no idea that the, this would cause national attention to it. Uh, he knew there was nothing he could do. If he, anybody found him out there outside of Wickenburg digging in the ground, he would have ended up on the other side of a rope. If there was a treasure, it seems unlikely that Molly Shepard or William Kruger ever recovered it. Shepard disappeared soon after the incident, fueling rumors that she had died of her wounds. Kruger last surfaced 13 years after the massacre when he sued the government for money that he claimed to have lost in the attack. During the 1870s, the Wickenburg massacre caused a national outrage. Within 18 months of the attack, the Yavapai were driven off the reservation by a government determined to punish them for their attack. Eventually, hundreds of innocent men, women, and children died from starvation and disease. We may never know who was responsible for the Wickenburg massacre. However, we do know that the list of victims include many more than the six men who were killed on that violent morning more than a century ago. Next, a young mother loses her memory after undergoing a risky surgery. Then one day, she leaves home and never returns. Houston, Texas. One warm spring afternoon, Mary Yurick was on her way to visit her sister Pat, as she did almost every day. Suddenly, she was overcome by a feeling of dread. I could feel it in my bones. I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't pinpoint it. Her little boy, Eugene, he was in the doorway, the door wide open, and I knew then that uh, something was wrong because Pat didn't allow the children out by themselves at all. And then I found Sheila in the kitchen. And she was just having a field day with the water and the dishes. The water was all over the counters. It went all in the floor. And I said, Sheila, where's Mama? Where's Mama? Oh, Mama's asleep. I went into the bedroom, and I saw Pat laying halfway on the bed and half off. 
and I tried to waken her, and I could not waken her. At the hospital, the doctors discovered that an aneurysm was blocking the blood flow to Pat's brain. The doctors had to act quickly. They performed a risky operation that saved Pat's life, but there was an unexpected complication. She didn't know who I was. She didn't know her husband. Hi, baby. How are you feeling? You feel better now? She didn't know anything. Everything was gone. She woke up into a different world than what she went to sleep in. Jean, Sheila, then your mommy looked pretty today. Pat did not recognize her children at all. She looked at me, and she says, who are they? Honey, you remember these pretty babies, don't you? Pat had to be taught to do everything again, even how to eat. It was all too much for her husband, who filed for divorce and was granted custody of their children. A short time later, a woman who had been hired to look after Pat called Mary at work. Pat had disappeared. Six weeks later, Pat was picked up for loitering nearly 700 miles away in Alabama, where she and Mary had lived when they were young. Pat's memory never fully returned, but eventually her life became more normal. She even began dating Troy Carlton, a construction worker. I want to introduce you to my sister-in-law. And I walked in, and there was Pat. It's Patricia Snyder. Patricia, this is my good friend, Troy. Howdy. Nice to meet you. Hello. I made some kind of remark about it being recess in heaven with angels running around there, and next thing you know, we were dating. When I first met Pat, I was unaware totally of any medical problems. When I was made aware of the fact that she had these problems, uh, it, didn't, it didn't decrease my feelings for her, not in any way. If anything, they increased through concern. Pat and Troy were soon married. Troy encouraged Pat to fight for custody of her children and a court hearing was soon scheduled. Seven days before the court date, Troy came home for lunch at noon, as he did every day. Hey, Patricia! Laying on the dining Patricia. room table was her purse, a wallet, keys. Pat was gone. Finally, I called Mary, her sister. Mary responded, oh, Lord. I said, what you mean, oh, Lord? She said, I bet Pat walked off. I said, what in the hell are you talking about, Pat walked off? Three weeks later, Pat was seen on the other side of town. Troy immediately drove to pick her up. Hi, stranger. Hi there, sweetie. Are you mad at me? No, sweetie. You want to go home? Yes. I don't have any idea where she ever went. I don't have any idea why she went. I don't know what she did while she was gone. She never discussed it, period. Troy assumed Pat's disappearance was an isolated incident, but he was wrong. Pat wandered off seven more times within the next year, and then one time, she could not be found. Pat was missing for 13 months. Patricia. And then she surfaced in San Diego, California. Evidently, her memory had returned enough to give a welfare worker her maiden name and her birthplace. The welfare worker found one of Pat's aunts in Birmingham, but the aunt believed Pat was still in Houston and did nothing to follow it up. That was the last time that anybody ever saw or heard from Pat Carlton. Eventually, Troy Carlton remarried, but with his current wife's support, he is doing everything that he can to aid in the search. I couldn't live with Pat again. I'm married. I've raised two stepchildren. 
one of my own. I, I wouldn't trade what I've got for anything in the world. But I would like to find out that Pat is alive, healthy, and I'd like to see her have the happiness that she deserves. Update. Patricia Carlton was found in San Francisco 33 years after she disappeared. Her family reports that she is safe and living with them. She has not wandered off since returning home. Coming up, these are images of a notorious bank robber. Perhaps you can help the police identify him. On a previous broadcast, we featured the story of Jackie Dragon, who was adopted by a California couple when she was just a baby. When Jackie was 12, she found her adoption papers and learned the names of her birth parents. It was a big thing. It was a, it was a turning point. It was something that I knew from that point on that someday I would find those people. After nine years of searching, Jackie finally tracked down her biological mother, Marge Ryder. Hi, may I speak with Marge Ryder, please? Speaking. Marge was living in Winchester, Illinois. The phone call from Jackie was a total surprise. Does the date February 16th, 1964 mean anything to you? What did you say your name was again? Well, my name is Jackie. I was already sitting down and I felt like I had just fallen into a chair because it was, I've never had a shock like that before. Well, do you have time to talk right now? Look at the likeness there. Jackie learned she had three sisters. Only the youngest, Tracy, had been raised by March. Her two other sisters, Laura May and Dawn Marie, had also been put up for adoption. <laughs> it, would, it was very exciting. I couldn't believe it. It was like, there's more? You're kidding. There's something more that I didn't know? I would love the opportunity to find my sisters, Laura May and Dawn Marie. I don't know if those are their names still. I like to think that somewhere, wherever they are, that they know that they're adopted and that they wonder where they came from. They were mine. I did love them. I do love them. And it would be nice to make the family complete again. Update. Thanks to our viewers, Marge and Jackie's dream of reuniting their family finally came true. They were contacted by Marge's two other daughters, Laura May, whose adoptive name is Susan, and Dawn Marie, now Carlin. Three months after our broadcast, Susan arrived at Jackie's home in Glendale, California. Marge and her youngest daughter, Tracy, flew in from Illinois for this very special reunion. So much on the phone. Yeah. Meeting them was really nerve wracking because it's like I wasn't quite sure what to expect and what they would expect of me. Did your talk? And then after I got here, it's just all seemed to flow. It was very natural. The last time I remember seeing Laura, she was in a high chair. And now here she is all grown up and I'm still looking for this little girl. You know, and that's it's kind of hard. A short time later, Carlin arrived. Um, I grew up knowing that I was adopted, but I didn't know anything about who my real parents were. And it's nice to know, you know, who your family is, you know, what your background is, you know, and learn more about them. I think when I first started feeling really comfortable was when we went out and took some Polaroids, and it was a really neat feeling to have a picture right in front of me and see all of us standing together. It's a very once-in-a-lifetime kind of a thing to find a sister that you've never met. Everybody smile. Each one is totally individual. They're all strong, I've found out. And they've done good with their lives. I'm proud of all four of them. And so now the family circle is finally complete. 
they all still keep in touch and know that they will never be separated again. Spokane, Washington. One fall day, a well-dressed man enters a local bank. May I help you? Stand up and move away from the desk, quickly. Come on, move over. Back away from the counter, quickly. Don't touch any alarms. Do exactly as you're told. No fast moves. Keep your hands where I can The robber is calm, in control, and prepared for anything. Take them out slowly. I have a police scanner here. Okay, he shows the terrified the employees a police scanner, claiming that he will know if they try Ooh. to alert the police. The robber orders everyone into the vault and then follows them in. Hurry it up. It's come his on, first on, robbery, on. and he'll walk away with more than $100,000. Hurry up. It's all over in less than five Give minutes. The robber leaves no fingerprints and even manages to avoid being photographed. The reason for that is the way he very quickly got control of the situation prevented uh, any photographs from being obtained. Almost a year later, the bandit stole $14,000 from another Spokane bank, but this time he got an unexpected surprise. A, a dye pack was given to the robber, which went off very shortly after he left the bank, within seconds of him leaving the bank. Obviously, that caused a commotion on the street, and a witness did observe that commotion. After another bank robbery three months later, bank employees were able to create composites of the bandit. However, these sketches were no substitute for photographs. Amazingly, the robber had managed to avoid all of the cameras in all of the banks. But early the next summer, his luck changed. This time, frightened but quick-thinking bank tellers took a chance. We said hi, and he said hi, and he walked up to the counter and pulled out his gun and put on sunglasses at the same time, and then told us that he wanted to go into the vault and get the money. And he told us to empty out the teller drawers. He went to one drawer at a time. And when we were emptying them out, that we you know, pulled all the money out, and there's a bill trap underneath some of the bills. We pulled the money out from underneath the bill trap, which triggered the alarm. Not only was the silent alarm activated, but the bank's surveillance camera was also triggered. For the first time, the robber was caught on film. Getting a photo in this robbery was a, a big step forward for us in our investigation. Up till this point, all we had were, were witness uh, descriptions of the bank robber. It did result in us linking him to three additional bank robberies as a suspect uh, in Tucson, Arizona. So that was, again, a major step forward in, in determining the, the scope of what he's been doing, as well as an aid to identification. These are still frames from the videotape. The robber appears to be six feet to six feet two inches tall and weighs between 200 and 220 pounds. Over the years, he has made off with more than $400,000. If anyone has any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a rock from Mars may hold proof that we are not alone in the universe. Deep space. Each new image brings up the age-old question, is there life somewhere else in the universe? Some imagine the answer would come from a spaceship carrying aliens from a faraway civilization. But in fact, the truth might be hidden in this ordinary looking piece of meteorite known as rock number 84001. Today, rock 84001 
speaks to us across all those billions of years and millions of miles. It speaks of the possibility of life. This meteorite came from the planet Mars and traveled millions of miles over millions of years until it finally slammed into Earth. It may forever change the way we view the universe. This meteorite, if it should prove true, would be literally one of the turning points, one of the defining epochs in all of human exploration and discovery. I think it would be almost an icon for the 20th century. Some scientists theorize that the seeds for life on Earth were planted by microorganisms from Mars. Ironically, what may prove to be the most remarkable discovery in the history of mankind began with a completely unremarkable event. Antarctica, December 1984. Dr. Robert Skor was among a team of American scientists on a geological expedition searching for meteorites. Dr. Skor picked up the rock, now known as number 84001. It weighs only 4.2 pounds and is the size of a large potato. No one paid any attention to it, and for eight years it sat on a shelf gathering dust. This meteorite was essentially misclassified, or not very carefully classified, as an ordinary Earth meteorite. And only uh, later on, when a geologist named David Mittelfeld looked at it more carefully, did he realize, no, this is characteristic of a Martian meteorite. It is just the precise ratio of certain isotopes that make it clear that it came from Mars. As it turned out, 84001 was only the 12th Martian meteorite ever found. It is 4.5 billion years old, almost as old as our solar system, and existed at least one billion years before life began on Earth. A team of NASA scientists finally analyzed the rock. Deep within were what appeared to be signs of life. The fossilized remains of dozens of incredibly tiny microorganisms. It's not a smoking gun. As we've said in our paper, we have not found proof of living biogenic activity in this Martian sample, but we have a trail of evidence. For a scientist, a trail of evidence is like a map to buried treasure. However, this map goes back in time, as well as taking us to a different place. It suggests a remarkable journey that began on Mars four and a half billion years ago when our solar system was just taking shape. At the same time 84001 was being formed, Mars was being bombarded by a catastrophic meteor storm. Its surface was left covered with craters and crevices. Early in the history of Mars, we feel it was warmer and it was wetter. There was abundance of water on the surface of the planet. The atmosphere was more dense. Liquid water moved across the surface of the planet. It also percolated down through the cracks. Over the next 500 million years, chemical reactions in this primeval soup apparently produced a primitive life form. As the water evaporated, the microscopic life forms were enclosed in rock and became fossilized. One such rock may have been 84001. Then it sat on the surface of the planet for a period of time up until 16 million years ago when a large meteorite a comet possibly, slammed into the surface of Mars with enough energy that it caused it to be lifted off the surface of Mars and escape the gravitational field of the planet. It traveled through space for 16 million years and 13,000 years ago fell on the ice fields of the Antarctic. In 1984, Robbie Score picked it up and the rest is history. It is at this point that history supposedly takes an incredible turn. While the organisms in 84001 were fossilized, it's quite possible that other meteorites carried living organisms all the way to Earth. These organisms could have been the source of all life on our planet. To put it simply, the human race may, in fact, be Martian. 
No doubt that life could have originated on Mars and come to Earth billions of years ago in this kind of process where something hits Mars and knocks pieces loose. And likewise, it's just as possible, more or less, that life could have originated on Earth and gone to Mars. The possibilities are enough to excite even skeptical scientists. But they warn that 84001 is not definitive proof of life on Mars. What we really need to do is to send a sample return mission, dig up Martian soil, dig up a rock, ideally from a meter or two beneath the soil, bring it back, chemically analyze it in pristine lab, find a cell, it's done. On December 4th, 1996, the unmanned Pathfinder spacecraft took off for Mars. During its nine-month visit to the Red Planet, Pathfinder collected more than 17,000 images and performed more than a dozen chemical studies of rocks, soil, and weather data. We're really intrigued with the possibility that life may still exist on Mars. And if it does exist, it, it almost has to exist underneath the surface. Now, that doesn't mean little green men or you know UFOs or anything like that, but it does mean that uh, scientists really do believe that life does exist in other places, and we just have to find it. I never dreamed that I would have the opportunity to work on a problem of this magnitude. This is a tremendous awakening Five, to mankind four, three, that, hey, we may not be alone one, in this vast universe in which we reside. Perhaps there are people out there on these other bodies that are also searching for life. NASA has continued to probe for life-supporting conditions on Mars. During its Phoenix mission in 2008, NASA landed a robotic spacecraft on the surface of the planet and tested for traces of water in the soil and atmosphere. Scientists still hope to get one step closer to answering the age-old question. Are we alone? Or is there any other life out there?